Chunk 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 Hey everybody, great to see you today. We're back with another edition of Practical MDO. Today we're talking about why optimization convergence is important. The whole idea here is that we need to get a converged optimization result so that we're comparing and understanding designs that are optimal. If the result is not converged, the values that you're looking at, including the constraints and the objective, don't correspond with an optimal design. It's something along the way. It's just a design, not the optimal design. Additionally, by getting converged optimization results, we're able to do an apples to apples comparison across different optimization cases. I'll get more into that later. This, of course, has to do with the optimization subcategory in this course. One of my favorite things that I get to do as part of my job is to receive tips and ideas from other people and then create that into a lesson, create that into a lecture and a notebook. Now, you might know the name Justin Gray. You might know Justin personally, but he really set me up for success here with a, a kind of series of scrawled notes with some ideas for topics. Here is one of them, and, and you can see everything that I'm working with for this lesson. It, it's these, these lines right here. It says, why is opt convergence important? So you get smooth trends. So first, I want to introduce what I mean by convergence. There are some formal mathematic definitions, but I don't want to get too lost into the details there. I kind of want to zoom into what I mean by convergence by looking at a few graphs and plots. Let's take a look at this together. So here is an example of an optimization problem. This is called the Rosenbrock function. It's a notoriously challenging problem to optimize on. This is because it's essentially a paraboloid, but there are very sharp corners and then a very, very shallow parabola where the actual optimum exists. We know that the actual optimum exists at 1, 1, but the optimizer needs to figure it out. So let's take a look here. If we start at 2, 2, it, it moves due to the, the sharpness of this, this paraboloid shape, and it slowly settles into the shallow optimum. But then it moves to the real optimum by traversing through the space. In this case, we're using a gradient-based SLSQP optimizer, but any gradient-based optimizer will probably perform close to the same way. But let's take a look at what it means to have convergence. How do we know when the optimizer is done converging? We knew a priori that you know, 1 comma 1 is the answer, but of course, in general, you won't know what the answer is. So how do you know when the optimizer is done? Here, let's take a look at the plot of the objective value with respect to the iterations, the optimization iterations. It might make sense for you to say, okay, I think the, the optimizer is done converging when the objective doesn't change that much. And here's what it looks like. It, it first increases greatly the objective value, and then it slowly decreases. And heck, by iteration 12, we're, we're almost at zero, which is, which is, in this case, the optimum. Now, you might look at this and say, oh, I, th I think it was done converging by iteration 12. But in reality, it, it was still kind of chugging along here. Just graphically is not a good way to look at it. So let's take a look at the log of the objective function. This allows us to see much more fine-grained detail and, and really get into the nuts and bolts of what this objective function is doing. Here we see that, okay, the log of the objective, it does start large and around that 12 or, or 10 iteration spot, it does kind of level out a little bit, but it keeps going. The optimizer keeps progressing. This corresponds with finding that kind of shallow paraboloid and then actually moving towards the optimum. This log plot is a great way to see, okay, well, actually it was still making progress. It was making progress all the way out to 24, 25 iterations. Another way to kind of think about convergence is to look at design variable values. So here we have the x and y values corresponding to this optimization problem I just showed you for the Rosenbrock function. It starts at 2, 2, it jumps around a little bit. Uh, and again, around this 10 or 12 iteration point, it levels out a little bit, but it's still making progress. It's still moving. Eventually, we settle down in the 1, 1 region. And again, I don't mean to focus on the Rosenbrock function or the actual values here. I simply want to show some example convergence plots. I want to show the objective, how it changes across the iterations, and the design variable values as they change. There are going to be times when you're performing optimizations where you think, hey, I, I think I'm done converging, but there may be more room for it to improve. There may be more room for it to, to find a better answer. And so this is where the kind of mathematical conditions of optimization need to come into play. You can't just look at a plot and say, hey, I think it's done. We're good to go here. You want to actually be able to say, okay, I know this is mathematically an optimum. How do we do that? Well, I'm going to draw from the Engineering Design Optimization textbook by Martin Zinning and show just a beautiful snippet from it here. There are some examples of different types of extrema within a function on the top here. We have a minimum, a weak minimum, a saddle point, and a maximum in order going from left to right. And then based on a, a whole bunch of math that I'm not going to go into here, the 
categorization of these extrema really comes down to the Hessian or the second derivatives. So it's not the Jacobian, the first derivatives, but it's actually the Hessian, the second derivatives that help us understand how to categorize these extrema. If the Hessian is positive definite, we know that we have a minimum in the top left. If it's positive semi-definite, then we have a weak minimal line. We have a, a kind of singular space in the design space. If it's indefinite, we have a saddle point. So it's somewhere where you could improve the function if you go off of it. But at this point, the Jacobian is zero. The, this gradient of F is zero. And if it's negative definite, if the Hessian is kind of curved in this way, we know that we have a maximum. Again, for all of these cases, the Jacobian is going to be zero because we're at kind of a flat point in the design space. But that's when we need to look at the Hessian. I highly encourage you to check out section 4.1.4 in engineering design optimization for a much more rigorous mathematic definition of what all this means. But just know that on some level, we need to care about the second derivatives to prove that we have an optimal point. Now for, for simplification purposes, I was just talking about unconstrained optimization there. For constrained optimization, we need to care about the karush cohn tucker or KKT conditions. These KKT conditions mean that the constraints are satisfied at the optimal point. Now again, I'm going to hand wave away a lot of the math, but please check out section 5.3 in the book for a lot more information about these KKT conditions. But just know that it means that even in the case of constrained optimization, we still have a mathematically provable way to say that this is a local minimum. And so this is a great segue into my next point, which is that converged results mean that these constraints are satisfied. If you don't have a converged optimization, there's a chance that you could be looking at a result that's a design that does not satisfy all the constraints. What this would mean is that if you had like a structural constraint, it means that your aircraft would fail. If you had like a, a fuel burn constraint, it might mean that it would run out of fuel, for example. There are many different ways that not having a fully converged optimization problem means that your physics are not being satisfied or your design is not meeting all of the constraints or requirements that you're setting. This is why you must have a fully optimized result to be able to say, hey, this design meets all of the criteria that I specified and I know that it will perform this well. If you don't have that, you might be comparing designs that are unfair for each other and we'll get more into that later. But here's an example and this actually comes from a, a previous lesson, the multi-objective optimization lesson. Here I want to explain why we need to converge each one of these results. So let's say we have a constraint on zero fuel weight. Again, I don't want to get into the physics of the problem too much, but here we're designing an aircraft. We might have zero fuel weight as a constraint and fuel burn as the objective. If we want to constrain zero fuel weight and then say, hey, please optimize the fuel burn for each one of these points, we need to have a fully converged solution to get the, the kind of Pareto front, the optimal design for the fuel burn. These points start out at not the optimal point, and each one of these points then converges as we do an optimization for every single one. This allows us to get a very nice kind of set of smooth trends. This allows us to compare these different designs. And this is a great segue into the next point here. So you might remember Justin's note in the beginning. It says, why is optimization convergence important? It says, so you get smooth trends. The whole idea here, and like I mentioned with the Pareto front, is that we want to be able to compare different designs. I'm now going to discuss one of my colleague, Anil's, work on aeropropulsive design. He did so many optimization problems and was able to compare designs by having fully converged optimizations. He faced many challenges in getting these to robustly converge and to make sure that everything made sense physically, but he did this and he did it very well. Let's talk about it. So he was looking at an aircraft, in this case, the Stark ABL, which has this tail cone thruster. This comes up in a few different lessons because it is such a good example problem. There's an amazingly tight coupling between the, the fluid dynamics, the aerodynamics, and the propulsive systems. Here he was modeling them using computational fluid dynamics, or CFD, and this makes a very expensive and complicated problem. Now he wanted to compare designs across a few different kind of sets of points. To do this in a valid way, you need to have fully converged optimizations. You need to say, okay, if I have different FPRs or fan pressure ratios, what does my power total look like? You can see in this figure that comes from Anil's dissertation that figure 4.12 says power requirements of all 50 single point optimal designs. So again, each one of these points is a fully converged solution. We get these nice smooth trends that allow us to say, okay, if I have a, a FIPPER of 1.25, this is what the kilowatt power total looks like. If it's a FIPPER of 1.35, here's what that power total looks like. That's wonderful. This, this allows you to make a very informed design decision. By having these fully converged results, you can say, okay, I know that this is the optimal design for this constraint, and here's what I know for this constraint. This allows you to push this up to management, say this is what it means for performance. It's really a beautiful way to really narrow down the design space. And I can't stress enough, the work that Anil and the team was doing was amazing. This is an extremely complex problem. Here are the just 25 of those optimizations kind of stacked up and shown together. 
you get different shapes, you get different error propulsive effects. It, it's really neat. Now again, this would not be valid to compare these designs if they weren't fully converged. What Anil is dealing with here was that the baseline design wasn't necessarily an interesting design point. But you can start from any baseline design, do an optimization, change your constraints or the problem formulation, and do another optimization, and then you can have a fair comparison between these two designs. So why is optimization convergence important? By having fully converged results, you're able to have an apples to apples comparison, you're able to have a fair comparison, and to really drill down into the details of what different constraints mean, what different design variables mean, and what it means for your design space. Remember, we're doing MDO for a reason, and the reason is to make machines better, more efficient, more capable, more performant, whatever that means. Having a fully converged optimization allows you to say, this is the best design for this particular set of constraints. That's beautiful. That's why we need to care about actual optimization convergence. That's why we need to see these numbers get to a reasonable point. Now again, check out the engineering design optimization book for a lot more of the theory details, but I hope you feel motivated to converge your optimizations fully. As always, please hit those like and subscribe buttons and thank you very much for watching. Guys, gals, and non-binary pals, take care. Bye.